Ladies and gentlemen and in-betweeners, on this week's On the Rocks, we welcome drag race alum Peppermint to chat about her new album, A Girl Like Me, and we are chatting with one of the stars of Bloomhouse's latest horror flicks, Freaky, with Misha Osherovich, with my guest co-host, LGBTQ filmmaker and... and LGBTQ filmmaker maker. Oh, I'm getting all I'm just getting all excited for today. Bowie McFadden and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. <laughs> And most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy, it's going to be a bumpy night. I'm already, like, mixing up my words. It's been a long day. It's been a long week, okay? Buttons and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, the place where we're too glad to give a damn. COVID <laughs> cases are spiking higher than my cholesterol. Wear a mask, people. It hides your wrinkles. Uh, this show is brought to you by Drag4.fans, uh, the free-to-use website connecting drag queens with their fans. Uh, with live shows, one-on-one -on -one chats, and more, go to drag4.fans and sign up for your free account today. Uh, Saturday, November 21st, I will serve as the host for the Gay Desert Guide, Zoom Speed Dating for men of all ages. It's a lot of fun. You can meet your future Prince Charming, a new friend, or even a business contact, or a one-night Zoom stand. I don't care. Visit gaydesertguide.com uh, slash events for more info. Use OTR25 at checkout for a little discount for me. Uh, Kurt, do you have a pun for us? I do, yes. Oh, you're so punny. Hurry up. I hope you're ready for this one. <laughs> Me too. Uh, do, how do you make holy water? Uh, how do you make holy water? You, I don't know. You, you, you boil the hell out of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> wah, wah. You know we need know. a wah, wah, Kurt. I, uh, I, I have it in here. Hold on. Yeah, I, I apologize for that pun. Yeah. Meh. Uh, <laughs> You better find it, Kurt. Yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. The show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and or listen to our every one of over 230 episodes at ontherocksradioshow.com. Hello to our listeners around the nation on every major podcast platform and on the Facebook pages of GED Magazine and I Love Gay LGBT. And, of course, our very own On The Rocks Radio Show Facebook page. Uh, give us a like. Uh, we are now streaming on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV on the Out at Dot TV app. Download that. Follow us. Leave a comment wherever you watch or listen to us. Like us on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks on Air. Send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up. Info at On the Rocks Radio Show dot com. Send us your questions, comments, and nudes. Blah. Okay, let me welcome our guest co-host today. So excited. Um, I met this person. Uh, drinking, of course, I was drinking uh, at a glad party uh, years ago, and and here we are. Bowie McFadden, an award-winning filmmaker, actor, and LGBTQ activist, Bowie creates with an aim to activate new ways of thinking, universal using universal metaphors to bridge and break binary barriers. Gen Z, Bowie's most recent work, which we're going to take a look at, highlights the real-world challenges of being non-binary by drawing comparisons to that of the gaming world. Um, the film was a grand jury winner at the 2020 Outfest uh, Fusion Film Festival and screened at the 2020 Outfest LA LGBTQ Film Festival in August. Gen Z is one of many, many films in Bowie's portfolio featuring strong uh, storytelling from an LGBTQ point of view. And now a student of the Act Now LGBTQ plus acting classes since January of 2019, Bowie has had the honor of training with Emmy-nominated actress Rain Valdez, Jamie Clayton, and Cassandra James. Please welcome Bowie McFadden. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's the photo. <laughs> that is the photo. So I just want to say, uh, your social media is such a beautiful blend of art, your personal journey, and filmmaking. Like, we get to see it all, but uh, your pictures are just stunning. Thank One of you. my favorite pictures um, that you posted. Uh, was a picture of you on the red carpet as an intern at Outfest. Oh my goodness! Years back, and then a recent red carpet, uh, well, as recent as we could get. Oh um, at, at Outfest, to say that you've grown mm. and uh, changed is an understatement. Tell me about your growth from that very first picture with the long hair. Uh, looking at it just just gives me chills. Um, yeah, the, the first one was 2018, and that, that was actually um, the year I, I first screened a film as a producer um, at Outfest. So it did not screen, it was Outfest Fusion, um, leading up to Outfest LA, the, the bigger festival. And I, I, I was really, I think that's 
I think of my life as like in acts, like a play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that was act one. That's where I was put in with a group of peers, filmmakers, um, and we, we, we got to talk about our queer identity. And, and so that was the touch point where I, my eyes were open to pronouns and, and, and how that related to me. So that was like the they, them moment. Um, and, and realizing that I, I didn't have to fit in the, just the female box. Um, and then I, th I think that second one was like almost a year later, um, a couple, well, I'm like, when are we now? What, what, what year, year is, is it? it? I don't even know what year, what day, <laughs> what time. I don't know anything. <laughs> um, but, you know, that I think, you know, I cut my hair shorter. I was really uh, masculine leaning. I love suits and ties. That's how we met, by yes. the way. We were the best dressed at the Glad Holiday Tidings party. And there was a lot of competition, but I mean, we're not competition. No. But literally, we saw each other across the room and we had the tie. Yes. I had the I had the pocket square. And it, it, was, it was kismet. It was love at first sight. <sighs> yes. And and so, yeah, I think that was, you know, that was kind of opening the door to, again, just uh, deviating from, um, um, I, I, I am feminine innately, innately yes, AFAB, yes. Um, but to where I am present day, which we were discussing mm -hmm. just beforehand, is is that uh, a couple months ago I came out trans non-binary. Um, I, I started T in August. Um, I'm saying this and I'm speaking openly because I want to normalize this, this type of conversation. I'm very proud of who I am. And um, I, I just am so thankful to the community um, and, and the folks that I have come up with who have put me in this place. I want to talk about coming out as trans and non non-binary. Mm -hmm. You've had to come out a few different ways in life. Yes. Uh, coming out as a lesbian. Yes. Then coming out as I want to be in the arts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is sometimes as difficult uh. a conversation as anything. Tell me about coming out as trans, having kind of conquered different coming out stages like that. Um, what was your experience coming out trans and how did your relationship with friends and family change from that coming out as compared to coming out as a lesbian in your previous life? Um, I think it was actually harder. So I, I started out like lesbian and then, you know, like, well, it was bisexual. I, I had dated men. I fell in love with a, a woman in a theater production I was in. Theater. I I'm, know. I'm telling you, every person, every if you've time. ever done theater, you've messed around with everybody. Like, right. I just have to say that. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so that took some thinking. Is it me or is it the character? Because I was always cast as male roles. Um, I played Dromeo Syracuse in uh, Comedy of Errors. And so once I, I made that determination, oh, this is a part of me, um, it was, you know, bisexual because I had dated men. Oh, no, I just like women, lesbian. Oh, non-binary, trans, actually, I'm straight. That's my experience. To be, you know, more masculine leaning and, and to be in love with women, I'm, I'm actually straight is, is the label that I, I resonate with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been an experience. I think it was harder to come out initially as, as lesbian, bisexual, um, I, I, because at that point in my I was so young and I was still wrapped up in everything that I had been brought up in whether it be um, being raised Catholic, um, same coming from Ohio, and it's very conservative in, in many areas. Um, fortunately, the area I grew up in was is liberal leaning, um, so I think it was that was the hardest part. But then I, I think once I I said yes to that, saying yes to myself, after that it's it's just been a joy ride. I'm just I'm along for the ride, and whatever I just let myself speak. You know, I I, I just. I'm, we talked about dating. I'm in a relationship with myself. I love that, by the way. I'm in a relationship with myself, which is why I have muscles on this arm and not the other. Yes. Wah, wah. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> but I think that's, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying yes to myself and I'm, I'm not questioning it. I'm just looking forward and saying, what, what do you need or, or, or what feels right and authentic so that you can step into your higher power and, and fulfill your purpose, the reason you're on this planet. Well, you know, uh, quarantine has been awful. COVID has just been awful to yep. businesses, um, uh, the LGBTQ community. Uh, you know, we're a highly depressed community as it is. Um, and now kind of being sanctioned off by ourselves, we're not able to get that fellowship from each other in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But I do think one of the benefits of quarantine from my friends, from filmmakers, from actors that we've talked to on the show, it's kind of taken away the noise. 
mm. on the same time or by the same token. And so we're able to reflect on ourselves and we're kind of realizing what we really want. You know, the pe we're in L.A. and so we're surrounded by people all the time. We have a lot of friends, quote, friends. Yeah that we go either to the nightclubs with or to the events with, to filmmaking symposiums, what have you. But then being stripped away of that, you kind of realize who in your life is really important, who is just noise, fun noise. I'm not saying that there's anything bad, but um, it's really you're kind of alone with yourself. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are starting to appreciate who we really are. If we don't like something, we don't like something. If we like something, then we like something. But I think we're going to emerge from this less apologetic for standing up for what we want because like we talked about right before the show started is at the end of the day, when you're on your deathbed, you're on your own mm -hmm. and you want to be proud of who you are and, and how you stuck up for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when did you move from o Ohio? I, I literally moved probably a month and a couple weeks uh, right after graduating. I came straight out here. Okay, what were the, some of the, uh, the most shocking parts about coming to L.A. from Ohio? What was the hardest to get used to? The hardest? Um, probably just the, the metro and getting around. I, you know, I, I came literally with just my clothes. And so, um, fortunately, I was, you know, in the right mind to be like, okay, find an apartment near transportation. But figuring out the train, which at the time was very kind of limited on where. Very limited, yeah. Um, the busing was like the next step to that. You know, there were many times I rode a bus far out into who knows where. <laughs> but I'm still here. <laughs> you are here and you, you are storytelling. What was your relationship in, in breaking into the LGBT community as an outsider? Um, my relationship... I, I again, you know, I'm a storyteller, and I think that's that was my in, mm. um, because somebody else had the courage to tell their story. It was actually so. It started in radio. I was at school for radio. Um, I I had been asked to be a sound engineer for uh, my school was conducting interviews um, from some of the faculty as it pertained to the community, and I I, ne I never really associated with myself at the time. Um, and so I was brought on board to do that, and I, I made a, a connection with uh, Jennifer Gutierrez, who works at the, the LA LGBT Center. Yes. Um, she bridged to me to a Jessica Brout at Outfest, and I had no idea what Outfest was. Let me, you know, I know we, we've, I, I worked there um, from 2017, three, three years, three beautiful years. I had no idea what Outfest was. I hadn't even been to one of their events, but let me tell you, the moment I, I saw a film that represented something so far from myself and yet so close to myself, that's when I knew the importance of visibility as I had never known it before. I want to take a look. Um, you know, your, your film, Gen Z, is a short film, and you put the short in short film. It's a one-minute film. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about the concept. Tell me, uh, tell me what you wanted to convey most and the challenge of putting everything into a one-minute film. Yes. Um, well, you could say a lot in a minute. Yeah. You know, uh, it's like the elevator pitch. What's your your this is the shark shark tank? It's like do it now. Boom, yep. Boom. If you don't have it, you know, you don't have it. And and so um, it was a collaboration with a very good friend of mine, Gray Crouch, and and they also identify non-binary. And and you know, it was just two two different points of view because I think what's really important is you know again I'm trans non-binary identifying. But my experience can't speak to the whole community. It's so it's a spectrum. And so we, we just bounce ideas back and forth. And we said, how can we make this universal? Because I think that's the, the thing is we're, we're trying to build empathy. So how can I make my story relate to somebody who feels like it's so distant? And so uh, you know, we had many big, broad ideas, but we condensed it to like in the gaming world and the idea of like you can take on an avatar and be anything. Mm -hmm. So why do we limit the human experience? to just uh, A or B, male or female, um, why can't we have fun and, and be fully expressive of who we are? And, and so um, with Gray and then uh, my twin, my identical twin, um, um, Mo McFadden, uh, the director and DP, we, you know, she really helped us edit it down and, and we, we cut it to a minute. And um, I, I, feel, I feel we were very successful in, in at least bringing that, that universal quality to it, the struggle of, of not being understood when you're just trying to be yourself. Excellent. Uh, let's, let's take a look at Gen Z.
Video games have always been an escape for me. They're the one place I've never been asked to choose a gender, because I'm just a player. When I press play, nobody knows who I am. I don't have to be male or female. I can be an ugly space creature, and nobody cares. So why can't people be more accepting in real life when I tell them my pronouns are they, them? I'm tired of fighting to defend my identity. I'm just a human being. And gender is over. And it is funny about the gaming world uh, because we're seeing more representation, I think, of gay characters in building profiles and even in Sims. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still kind of this um, this pocket of gamers that is still so anti-LGBT, which is so funny to, to your movie's point. It's like yeah. a game you really choose and you form. These gamers are not their characters, you know? Um, and uh, and so we are, we're waiting for Peppermint, by, by the way. Um, and so I, I, I love that expression. And that one minute film kind of encapsulates what I love about your social media. It's artistic, it tells <laughs> a story, you. and you're just not afraid to, to, to show um, who you are. Thank you. Uh, um, I wanna know about, uh, like you said, you are dating yourself. Yes. Um, this is Trans Awareness Week. Mm -hmm. And what I really want to celebrate about this week is the trans visibility um, that we've had even despite this last uh, election. Yeah. And I, th I would hope that through this Awareness Week that we can ask questions that we're afraid to ask. You know, we're so busy being angry with everybody on the outside. And sometimes I think the LGBT community can become angry on the inside because mm. we're not using the right, uh, the labels, the right phrasing. We're saying stuff that we don't realize is derogatory, but what I think it comes from a place of ignorance because we're not asking questions. Mm. I don't think we feel comfortable enough to ask these kind of questions. And so I wanna talk about love and dating. Yeah. Um, coming out as trans, non-binary, um, what is the dating scene like? How do you approach the subject? Where, where, where does one find somebody to date? <laughs> that is a, a loaded question. Great question. Because <laughs> I, I am so curious. Yeah. You know. Um. So I mean, to be honest, since I'm, I'm sure you know, quarantine has hit, and so, um, that that has presented challenges. I, I'd say for me personally, and that's what I, I've been quiet on the dating scene um because i've really worked on myself and i, I want to be comfortable in who i am because whoever i bring to a relationship whatever i bring I, I i want it to be free and available for that other individual um i, I don't know I, I think for me it's it's just going going to the places that you love to go i i, I think that i mean because I don't know. Maybe I'm not the you know the right person to to a ask that. I'm I'm pretty. Well, it's mm. funny because like the gay community, we have grinder, we have scruff. See, and I don't do so. Okay, so yeah. I mean, you bring that up. So there was a time. So when I was you know I came out as bisexual, and somebody was like, "Oh, but where do you go look for women?" And I was like, "I don't know. Like I'm I just you know I'm fresh off the boat from Ohio. Like I don't know." <laughs> and. Um, I, so they suggested some dating apps and and that I think that doesn't do it for me much the same way I, I find it so hard to I, I love that we're connected by zoom but as a theater kid and uh, you know we can't have the same interaction that we would in person yeah um, but I just lean into you know I, I I'm strategic about where I go and and how I spend my time and I think because I I, I know genuinely you know like spaces where I feel like I can be authentic that's a marker for me that I'm going to find somebody else that is right for me um, because we 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 connected in a place that that resonates with our experience how has your relationship with your family um, gotten better from these stages of your life um or has it, or has has it not? Uh, um, a mix. So my, you know, my family, I, hmm. so they, I, I think they know that I, I am of the queer experience. To be honest, I, I'm not 
I don't have as strong a, a family relationship as I, I would like at this point, just, you know, in drifting from, from most of them are in Ohio at this point. Um, but I know that they, they've expressed they love me unconditionally, even if they don't fully understand my experience. So um, I, I can't, I, I feel supported. I feel loved in all the ways that I need to be. Well, I certainly love and support you. Um, and, you. you know, we're also seeing, um, as, as the younger generation takes over, that they have made friends their family. And yeah. I think that that's uh, unconditional love. is It's where you need it. Um, I want to welcome to the show, uh, please welcome Peppermint, a longtime key figure in queer nightlife. Peppermint regularly performs to sold-out crowds around the world when we aren't under lockdown, of course. She has released five albums, including her hot off the press, A Girl Like Me, Letters to My Lovers. God, if I wrote a letter to my lover, it'd be an encyclopedia. <laughs> this is the first in a trilogy of album releases about the three stages of Peppermint's most recent relationship. Um, it is hot, by the way. We're going to take a little peek at, uh, at Best Sex. Uh, but recent projects include hosting at the 2020 Glass Media Awards, Black Queer t Town Hall, the first ever with co-creator Bob the Drag Queen, which we, uh, who we talked to during uh, during Pride, an appearance on Ryan Murphy's Emmy-winning series Pose, and of course we love the reoccurring role on CBS God Friended Me and uh, her guest role on the Fox scripted drama Deputy. As an activist, Peppermint has raised six-figure sums for prominent LGBT rights groups, partnered with Mac Cosmetics, Mac AIDS Fund, and is involved in the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. She has partnered with RuPaul, Drag Race winner Sasha Velour for a college speaking tour, virtually for now, but coming soon to a town near you, um, to focus on the challenges faced by transgender and non-binary people in today's political climate, among various other topics. Um, and in 2018, Peppermint was honored at Condé Nast's first annual Queeros Awards. Uh, uh, earned her a place on Variety's prestigious New Power of New York list and was named one of Out Magazine's Out 100 portfolio of the most influential LGBTQ people of the year. And as we celebrate Trans Awareness Week, we honor Peppermint for making history as the first out transgender contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race and the first out trans woman to originate a lead role on Broadway. Adding that minty fresh to your day, please welcome Peppermint. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Girl, you are giving us some red love, hot love. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Alexander. Alexander. Um, um, yeah, yeah, you know, you know I, I, um, I, feel I feel pretty, pretty you, know, you know, I feel, I feel pretty, pretty red hot. hot. <laughs> Girl, you are. Um, we are celebrating Trans Awareness Week, and I just have to ask you, how did it feel to hear President-elect uh, Joe Biden talk about the trans community in his very first speech as president-elect? Uh, I tweeted, I tweeted about, about this. this. It, it felt, felt great. great. I, mean, I mean, to, to like, like fine tune, tune what, what I had I said, and I think the sentiment, I, I, it was, it was a, a sentiment that I'd seen um, sort of matched by people all over on the internet, other trans people. This wasn't the first time that someone that is in a position of power has acknowledged uh, LGBT people. It's not. Obama did in his second term. Uh, in his uh, re-election sort of speech. But to hear, it's the first time that I've ever heard, and I believe we've ever heard, a president-elect in their first term yes. say the words transgender, the full words, not just LGBT, but actual transgender, the word transgender. And so it felt great. Uh, it, it was... It was, it was, it, I mean, it's a fact. It feels, it feels great to be seen and recognized and heard mm -hmm. and understood. And, and I think there might be some people who would can, um, who might criticize politicians using, throwing words around. They do all the time. That's probably the definition of politician. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, to me, I take it as a signal that Joe Biden and his administration are ready to really not only say the words at the acceptance speech, but really tackle the important issues that um, affect the, the community, which are many of them are the same issues that affect uh, the rest of the world and country. Um, you know, issues of uh, health care and employment. These are things that everybody cares about. But people in the trans community have less access to those things than the average person, uh, especially if you are someone who is visibly or visibly trans or that you're the, the status of being transgender is accessible to other people. Um, you know, and then on top of that, there's, there's things that are perpetuated by all of those things. The transgender murder rate, um, 
these are people, these are trans people who are murdered, usually at the hands of our lovers and our partners. Uh, and so many, there's many places in this country, many states, cities in this country where being trans, um, you know, is dangerous and not safe. And our laws don't necessarily, local laws don't necessarily protect from some of the things I was talking about. And so to hear our president-elect mention, um, it, it just shows that he is ready to do the work. And and now's the time, you know, we can't sit and wait in the shadows anymore. Um, Peppermint, what I love about you is that you always shoot from the hip. You're always, you know, just so transparent as to what you're thinking, what your thoughts are, what your opinions are, your own opinions, not what you've been rehearsed to say as an activist, <laughs> not what you should say, but what you feel that you that I identifies what you want to get across. And so I'm just going to be a thousand percent honest with you uh, because I respect that about you. When I first came out, when I came to L.A. and I was a gay newbie, um, I appreciated that the trans community should have equality like the gay community. Um, but I didn't understand how it was a part of the gay community. Um, and it was from volunteering, self-education, and becoming a close uh, with members, friends with the trans community, that I have such a better understanding. But what would you say to a gay man who doesn't quite understand the inclusion of the trans community in the LGB? Well, you know, that's um, a topic, a hot button topic of discussion. Uh, and I would say, you know what, it, it, because I'm trans, it doesn't mean I'm gay. And so by definition, we are right that, you know, someone's gender is not the same as their sexual sexuality, right? Yes. Um, and so just by that definition alone, transgender people don't necessarily have to be uh, a part of the gay community. There are lots of gay people who are also trans, um, and there are lots of heterosexual people who are trans. That doesn't mean that we are in, in the gay community because of how we identify. Um, and so by that regard, you do have a point. I think you're, I can certainly understand that. Um, and people who might have trouble understanding that connection can understand that your gender identity and or your gender and your sexual sexuality are um, are not necessarily, you know, they're not connected, you know, in that way. Um, and so your friend or whoever would say that would have a point. But my, I think the reason why we can, we put the LGB, t, the T onto the L and the G and the B um, and others, queer and others, is not necessarily for how we identify, it's for how we're discriminated against. Mm. We, you know, when people are attacking us or writing laws against us, they're rarely trying to dis dis distinguish between a lesbian or a bisexual person mm -hmm. or a trans woman or a gay man. A lot of people clearly do not know how to make that distinction. Yes. And so I'm talking about people outside of the, the LGBTQ plus community. And so uh, when we are attacked, when we are discriminated against, we we are treated in the same way. Uh, I believe that homophobia uh, and transphobia are just different brands of misogyny, which we also know affects women, fem, women, women identified people and femme people all the same, not all the same, but in all together. Um, and so that that is an important thing to note that just because we had marriage equality doesn't mean that reproductive rights for people who have uteruses and, and, and vaginas, uh, you know, it's instantly solved. Correct. You know, yeah. there's lots of people in the LGBTQ community who aren't planning on getting married. Uh, there's lots of people in the LGBTQ community who obviously are trans and bisexual and, and all of these different um, identities and ways of living. And so I think it's really important that we, from the like marriage equality, gay men only standpoint, yeah, a trans woman doesn't necessarily belong in that group necessarily. Although this trans woman marched across the Brooklyn Bridge in heels, you know, <laughs> more than once marching for the rights of people to get married. And I did not have a ring on my finger. Mm, yes. But, and, and I, I raised, raised half, half all that money we talked about before was, was raised uh, with, with the, the HRC, HRC was not, not for, for trans, trans rights. rights. It, it was, was for gay, gay people, people to get, get married. married. And, and so, so um, you know, you know I'd, I'd say, say it's, it's time, time to, to pick, pick keep, keep fighting, fighting 
There's more, more of us that are part of this community, community and we've carried. carried. We, we have, have heard about trans, trans women, women of color, color uh, being involved since, since the four stone wall yeah. at, at the, the Compton, Compton cafe, cafe and, and, and beyond. And, and so, you know, before, you know, before we, we start, start separating, separating and there are many, many trans, trans people who want to separate as well, but before we start separating, let's, let's ensure that we have equality for each person in there. And we will ask each person in the community what they need, and then we will give it to them. And so gay boys, y'all were first, but guess what? That means you have to do a lot of waiting while we get ours. Peppermint for president. That, that's what yes. I say. Peppermint, you started, um, we're, we're all theater kids. We all started yes. in kids theater. Bowie yeah. here also in theater. You know, we know as doing uh, children's theater, sometimes the shows were great. Sometimes the shows <laughs> were complete shit, right? What did you learn, though, about performing? You are one of the best performers mm. I have seen, not only as an MC, you command the room, but as a lip syncer, as a singer, as, as a comedian, you know how to work any type of media that you are in. What did you learn you. from mm -hmm. doing kids theater that kind of formed yes. your professional world to this day? You know, I learned really, <laughs> I was, I did a lot of, a lot of children's theater and there's one, I did, um, uh, Babes in Toyland. That was your first tape gig, right? That, yeah. Yeah. And I was so excited about that. It was one of the, it was a quite an experience. I won't say it was the worst experience I've ever had, but it was quite an experience. There was a costumer. I'm sorry, honey. I'm going to go. They, there was a costumer, the, the director I loved, I think her name was Mary. She was wonderful and she could see something in me that it felt like she could see something in me that was special. That's what it felt like. She saw something special in me. And I and I and and that resonated with me. But there was a costumer, oh honey, I remember her last name. I won't say it. Um, who was really a stickler for the rules I, I don't remember what it was. It was like, she wanted me to wear these socks that were like uncomfortable or not. Something was wrong with those socks. Oh, geez. I mean, they're socks. Socks are socks. Yes. And if you if you look at some socks and you're like, I ain't wearing those socks, believe me, there's a reason to not wear those socks. And so I was like, I'm not wearing these socks. And she was chasing me around that theater. I was hiding and I was, I was the spider. I had, I had a spider costume, costume on with, with eight, eight arms, arms and, and they, they were trapped by string. string. <laughs> and I was like <laughs> running in behind, behind things and like trying to dodge, dodge trying, trying to get, get away from this, this lady with these socks. socks. And, and you know, you know the, the biggest, biggest thing, thing that, that, that takeaway take for me, the biggest, biggest takeaway take for me from that was, you know what? Yes, yes. And I'm going to get, I hope I don't get struck down by lightning for this. Yes, there is a hairstylist. Yes, there's a makeup artist. And yes, there is a costumer. On, on that that that, that, that you will meet, meet um, on, on set, set. As, if, if it's, it's film, film um, and, and even, even when, when I was, I was on Broadway, Broadway you're gonna, gonna meet them. them. None, None of them, them know, know the real deal. Yeah. How to do your makeup and your hair and your body the way that you do. Mm. So make sure you speak up. <laughs> so let's talk about you speaking up. Um, a girl like me, letters to my lovers. Yes. It, it's a very naked album. And what I mean by naked is it's it's about your relationship um, and you, you just put it all out there. And your relationships in your life have kind of really shaped who you are. Um, you were inspired to come out as trans after a breakup, if, 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 if I have my facts right. And this album is very vulnerable. Uh, was it difficult to revisit this relationship in particular in putting it together? Yes. yes. <laughs> it was uh there were some really emotional moments uh at all ends of the emotional spectrum while writing it again while singing it because which is kind of a performance in the in the recording booth um and you know a lot of people don't know but i, I don't know what people know but it didn't necessarily occur to me always um, when, when recording, recording. Uh, uh, how, how useful, useful taking, taking yourself, yourself there mentally, mentally can be to getting the emotion across um, in the recording. You can hear when someone's just like, blah, 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 and when someone really feels it. 
And for me, going there meant really going there to the point where I was crying in the, in the booth. And, um, and so that was tough, but I knew that it was necessary for it to like really connect. Um, and I just had to kind of, I guess, peel back some of that protective layer that I had built up after the relationship. I had to kind of remove some of that and open some of that up to go back to it again. And I wanted to do it because I wanted to just be as honest as I possibly could. I've had other songs before, honey. I was talking about putting dollars in my titties and calling <laughs> people on the phone. They're being shady. That's fine. but And those things are very real. But fun. Uh, yeah, and fun. But I really wanted to sort of have the album that I've never heard as a young trans girl mm. and say to people, to trans people, look, this is, this is some experiences that we can have and you can be in control of these experiences. And then I also wanted to say to people who are not trans, cis people, maybe potentially the people who are our partners or our lovers or people who just walk by us on the street, we are just as worthy and capable yeah. The, as anyone else. And what I really love about the album is, you know, we get to see the bigger than life uh, peppermint uh, all the time in your photo shoots, um, in your interviews and things that you host. But this, we really got to see uh, a different side of you, which uh, it was sexy and sad at the same time. I don't, I don't know how else to, to, to describe it. Uh, your cover <laughs> of uh, Will You Love Me Tomorrow, literally in the very first few measures, I just burst into tears because you have this smoky quality, quality to your voice. It's storytelling. It's great singing. But it has this plaintive, uh, real chemistry that you can't fabricate. You can't auto-tune no. that chemistry, okay? <laughs> Well, and beautiful, beautiful lyrics, too. I, I wrote some down in listening because it, it just struck me. And if I, I think if you can get to people in the digital space, that's how you know you've done it. Um, a, a girl like me can't get, get give a man a baby, and when trouble comes, she's the first to take the fall. Like, gorgeous, gorgeous lyrics. And, and Thank you. I... Um, what you've spoken to in your songs it's it's a it really is a universal story it's so yes. beautiful and I, I just yeah and I, I I wonder your thoughts um because like I said that that lyric struck me um I'm you know trans non-binary um you know afab and so I I understand to a certain degree that the female experience and, and like I said that struck me so much because I said if, if you can't listen to that lyric and understand trans or not queer or not that that our you know like these stories are universal We're, we we all share the yeah. human experience i i wonder your thoughts on on what it's going to take to bridge that gap maybe it'll take more you know thing more artists whether they're singers or television or stories more of our stories being told right mm -hmm. um I think that's certainly going to be a part of it. It'll definitely take legislation yes. and policies coming, you know, from our government and our communities that open things up. And then to boot, we will, it's definitely going to take, um, you know, people feeling like they know us in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, GLAD has a, GLAD, according to GLAD, 80% uh, of people in this country have said that they have never met a trans person. <laughs> that's a lot of people and yeah. uh, you know like more people have said that they've seen a ghost than a trans yes. person yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's like right. wow and so you of course they don't people don't necessarily feel like they know us or understand us or get us or that what we need is important you know and so hopefully they'll be able to um, hear our stories told in the media that they consume. And that's, again, that's why I did this album. And A Girl Like Me is the heart of the album, for sure. And that letter, that that um those lyrics are, they were just really tough to write. You know, I have a songwriting partner. I co-wrote the entire album with Corey Tutt and Adam Joseph on, on various tracks. And that song was co-written with Adam Joseph. And I we had written some of the lyrics. We were just kind of going through, you know, there's a process. And we're going through and then this we kind of got to the end of what we had done and it was like so we're obviously it was during the pandemic we were 
on like Zoom or something. Like we couldn't hear each other, see each other. Um, but I was like, hello, did it? Like, I thought it got disconnected. He was so quiet. And then I heard him sniffling and he was crying. I've never cried written, writing a mute, writing a song. And, mm -hmm. and he's, I've never cried with him, anyone else writing my story and so it was very special and i'm very protective of a girl like me that song um and then will you still love me tomorrow obviously i didn't write it i wish i had because you know <laughs> drinks would be on me tonight <laughs> um, but obviously it's written by carol king uh and i love the song it's a hit <laughs> obviously uh i'd never had had the opportunity to hear it in as a as as a ballad like this until I uh, heard um, Roberta Flack's rendition, and so this is uh, more akin to the Roberta Flack version. Uh, but I wanted to really take those words and try to connect them to the trans to my trans experience. Uh, a lot of times, just because of the way that relationships roll and. Um, queerness can kind of play out in, in terms of like consensual adult relationships. Uh, I think, you know, casual encounters are a part of life, especially not only for queer people, for, uh, for everyone who's alive yes. in 2020. Um, yeah. and, and that question we ask, I think I find myself asking after a casual experience is what is this, if it's a good one, hopefully it is. I mean, it always is. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're doing all the work, girl. <laughs> What the question is for me is like, what is this going to turn into? Like, this was great, mm -hmm. but what what's tomorrow going to look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's something that we've lots of people have asked before. You know, well, and what uh, we're going to take a look at, at at a part of best sex, and um, we we chatted uh, for Metro Source Magazine or for a GD Magazine about this, and best mm -hmm. sex is about an amazing one night stand. Mm -hmm. And you think it's a one night stand and it kind of turned into something else. And then it kind of got a little dark. Um, tell me about best sex and about this amazing uh, one night stand. Tell me about that night. Well, uh, the song best sex, just the idea of it is really um, is really an ode or an anthem, I guess, an homage to um to all of the the fuck boys yes. who uh, end up <laughs> touring my bedroom. <laughs> it's like, here's um, the curtains, there's the bed. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, it's not by choice necessarily because there are a lot of folks that maybe, you know, like, oh, you know, he's cute, whatever. But uh, I think just kind of going back to what I was saying before, these casual encounters are more par for the course and they're the they're usually the they're not the exception they're the rule um at least in my experience and then many of the my girlfriend's experiences as well that we talk about mm -hmm. and we, we, there's a lot of overlap oh i'm going on a date with someone so oh he, oh well watch out for his which call it because i went with him last <laughs> night and so there's all of that and it's like oh my i know cis folks m kind must go through that a little bit but it it feels like a very Yes. Small dating pool for queer people and especially for trans people. Yes. Um, and and that definitely for trans women and this if they're part if they're hetero identified and date cis men, which is like I'm trying to figure out a way to put a spell on myself to to not be dating cis men. Um, but I can't break the curse. Girl, <laughs> we love what we love. It's a bad addiction. <laughs> but, uh, so I've had lots of uh, casual encounters. And, um, you know, some of them didn't want to stick around and some of them I would never ask to stick around. They are good at the sex. The sex is lovely, but they have no other redeeming qualities. Oh, and so, the worst. Uh, yeah, it's the worst. I was in such a jaded kind of bitchy love is not real mode um, when I had had one, one too many casual encounters. I had one and, you know, he was late and... I was like, you're late. I was like, okay, I guess this is going to be hate sex. And so, okay, let's do this. And then I was like ready to kick him out of that. I was like, get out, get out, get out. And he was like, no, no, no. Let's let's talk. 
well, how are you feeling about it? He, went, he asked me about my feelings. Mm. We got into all these conversations. And, and he spent the night, which for me, one of my ways of protecting myself against these sort of guys that are kind of predatory is to not have them stay the night, not open up everything to them. But this one ended up staying the night and, and we ended up being together for a year. And that's who this album is about. Uh, well, we're going to take a look at a best sex, but real fast, Peppermint, can we play a little rapid fire? Oh, let's do it. <laughs> okay, let's go. Celebrity you think you'd have the best sex with? Oh, my gosh. I hope it would either be uh, Lenny Kravitz. This Ooh. is a little sick. <laughs> Lenny Kravitz or Jason Momoa. Not that I think I'm Lisa Bonet, <laughs> and it's bizarre that they're both that have been is. with the same woman. <laughs> but I am so attracted to both of them, so I will take them both together, separate, same time, whatever, whenever, whatever, doesn't matter. Let's go. Next question. <laughs> okay. uh, what musician has shaped you the most? I'd say Janet Jackson. Mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, what is a challenge you would add to Drag Race? Uh, cooking. Oh, Ooh, that's eating. a really good one. <laughs> Cooking. I like that. I love that. You better write that down, girl. <laughs> uh, the worst Christmas gift you've ever received? Socks. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait till next month we hear about Peppermint's line of socks. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Uh, yes. Worst fashion trend that you've fallen victim to? The bump it. Now, I don't know if that was a fashion trend. Yes. yes it was this it, thing it that you was. put in your hair snooky, to yes. give you a lift. Yep. Honey, I had a bump it. Hey, you know it what? It's terrible. Most guys are putting a bump it in their pants anyway. It's false advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Peppermint, you are such a delight. I love following you. I love everything. Uh, and I want to thank you as a gay man, what you have done for the entire LGBTQ community. Um, thank you so much. Where do you want our, our audience to find you, follow you? People can and should follow me on all my social media, which is Peppermint247. Uh, it is, um, it's the same on all my social media, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, YouTube. I have a new show every single week called Pep Talks. It's on my Twitch channel, so you can go to Peppermint. Uh, just go to my link in bio and, and you can follow me on my Twitch as well. Patreon gets all the behind the scenes stuff. And uh, they can also, folks who are really interested in if you like this album and really, really want to treat yourself to something this holiday season, then you can pick up a vinyl copy, a limited edition vinyl copy of the album on my, if you go to my, again, link in bio on my Instagram, uh, there's a special link because you can't get a vinyl album from iTunes. Uh, You have to go to a specific link to get it. Um, Get yourself a vinyl copy. It's signed and it's fabulous. Well, and vinyls are on the upsell, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Someone sent me a record player. It's right over there. Who... Uh, they sent me a record player, yeah, like, as a, a gift. Yeah, you can buy I'm them like, now what is yep. on the regular. Peppermint, I love you so much. Thank you so much for visiting <laughs> us. Um, and for our viewers, we have a special treat. We are taking a little peek at Best Sex. Thank you, Peppermint. Happy Trans Awareness Week. Thank you. <laughs> you don't want nobody seeing me with you. You ain't got no time for me until you do. You ain't got too much, but I know this much is true. You got the best sex. Oh boy, you got the best sex. As for the rest,
Well, and now we know the story behind Peppermint's best sex. <laughs> so make sure you get her album and on vinyl today. Yes. Um, I am so excited to talk to our next guest. I'm a huge horror film like fanatic. Yes. I, I I just am. Um, I, I just love it. Uh, <laughs> Misha, born and raised in Washington, D.C., uh, is an actor, filmmaker, and mental health, LGBTQIA plus activist. Thank God, based in L.A. now. Uh, Misha <laughs> was most recently uh, recorded in the television seri- series Notes for Atu with my boyfriend, Zachary Quinto, uh, for AMC, and appeared in the Warner Brothers feature film The Goldfinch, by the way. And you have to wait till the very end, and there's Misha with a gun. <laughs> I loved it. Um, uh, Misha has amassed numerous stage credits, including... Uh, a wonderful production of A Clockwork Orange for New World Stages in New York and Henry IV at Martha Vineyard's Playhouse. Um, And in uh, 2019, which we're going to talk all about, Misha produced and starred in the short film uh, Every Day, which is E period, very, D period, AY, which screened at several film festivals in the United States and internationally, racking up awards including Best LGBT Film for the Indie Fest and Best Experimental Short Film for Top Shorts Film Festival. And currently, Misha can be seen in the number one film at the box office, Bloomhouse's latest horror flick, Freaky, uh, with my ex-boyfriend, Vince Vaughn. Please welcome, <laughs> literally our favorite teddy bear, because it's a Russian translation. Please welcome Misha Sharovich. <laughs> What is all this magnificent research that y'all have done? Oh, girl. <laughs> we got scientific up in here. <laughs> yes. Apparently, apparently. So every actor... Hi, guys. Hi. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. Every actor dreams about the moment that they're on big screen. And, of course, you were on big screen in, in Goldfinch. Uh, this is a little bit different. How did you find out that Freaky was number one this last weekend? Uh, how did I find out? I mean, literally everybody telling me because also we're in a pandemic. So yeah. I'm so glad we're number one. Also, like, there's how many movies are there out there right now? But but, but still, um, but, yes. but if you're gonna brave COVID, like, in your, yep. like the movie you choose is very important. Absolutely, and if you're gonna brave COVID, might as well choose a movie where everybody's dying and also laughing. So. <laughs> Ah, well, that's Trump, what, what Trump is doing. Um, but it, it, it must be incredibly bittersweet uh, that the film comes out during COVID because movie going, like we said, is not the easiest. Red carpets are not really happening and the personal appearances are all now d- during Zoom. Is it weird celebrating the success from your room? <laughs> um, a little bit, not going to lie. It's, it's a little strange. Um, I'm very lucky to have a little COVID pod. Some of them are my cast members from Freaky, but uh, yeah, it's... It's a little weird, and also, honestly, I have to say that if there is going to be a film out right now, I mean it when I say that our film is a lovely distraction. So, yes. you know, go see it. Go see it safely, because I think it's if there was a film right now that people need it, it might be this one. Uh, you, you, you exactly said it. It encapsulates everything that, that I love. Um, well, Bloomhouse number one, but it's a little campy, a little hoary. Uh, it's a little gay. I mean, it's, it, I, I just love it. Um, now, this quarantine, as we've been talking on the show today, has made everybody reflective uh, about yes. themselves, their friends, their life, their future, their partners, their outfits. Um, <laughs> quarantine <laughs> kind of inspired you to come out as non-binary. It really did. Um, so, look, I'm a, I'm a busy human. I like to keep myself busy. And I've been kind of grappling with my queerness for some years now. But it was really with, with my roommate away and literally being alone in my apartment. I, like, yeah. had this moment of, like, well, well, fuck. I, I don't think I don't think I'm a man. I, okay, okay. I guess I'm non-binary, and I said it out loud, and then all of a sudden, literally, my chest got lighter. So I'm like, okay, good. This is the thing that we want to put out into the world. But yeah, it was the alone time to kind of like process it. Uh, Bowie said it so well. It's like now's now's the time that we're all dating ourselves. Yeah. You know, we're kind of on a Ooh, first like date that. with ourselves. I we're like finding that. out what we like, what what we respond to, right. what get what gets us sexy. What I'm trying know. to love myself first, yes, and then I'll <laughs> love somebody else. That that's exactly right. Um, yes, I have, to, I have to tell you, you younger generation, and now I feel like somebody's grandfather <laughs> um, in the LGBT community. There's so many terms and expressions of identity now. When I grew up, it was you're gay or you're straight. And then a little bit older, then it was like, okay, then you're bi, which was beginning, uh, was begun to get actual recognition as a real thing because we thought, oh, bi, that's just code for really gay, but it's my small step. Um, and now we have this phrase non binary, and we like to be very open and honest on the show. To somebody that does not know, what does non binary mean to you? Say so that to me. Yeah. No, no, Great. Okay. Um... <laughs> 
I mean, so look, I'm I'm actually really enjoying this question whenever I get it because literally everybody has a different answer, at That's least a slightly exactly different right. answer. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was actually, it was very much the ante and the rejection as opposed to like, I am this. What I meant, what I said, like, I've never grown up feeling traditionally masculine. I've never grown up really liking being called a man or be a man or he, his, none of that ever like deeply resonated with me. And I grew up in a rural conservative Russian household. So like, I didn't have the, the language, the ability, the support to even explore gayness, much less queerness. Um, but it got to a point where I made my adult friends and I moved to New York and then LA and I started using gender expression through clothing to kind of just be a bit more free. And all of a sudden it felt so deeply wrong to call myself a man and to go by he, him, because it didn't feel like me. It didn't feel like I was referring to me when I said he, Misha, man, Misha. Um, so being non-binary for me means rejecting the he, but also accepting that I'm, I don't use she, her pronouns and that I'm not, I don't identify as a woman. And I'm happiest when I'm a big giant question mark. And that makes me feel literally lighter. So that, that was what non-binary means to me. It's funny, uh, you identify stronger in life by not identifying. <laughs> yeah. You, you know what I mean? Ain't it great? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, as, as we know, you grew up in a, in a very conservative uh, Russian uh, household. Um, mm -hmm. Coming out, from, from what I, I've heard uh, for you, was, was not a great coming out story. Um, and so now, did you have a second coming out? And how did that go? Uh, yeah, I guess I did. Um, yeah, the first coming out was <laughs> real messy. And, you know, my parents weren't expecting it. I wasn't expecting it. I was essentially outed. It's a whole thing. Well, that's but, terrible um, when it happens, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't great. Um, and my parents and I are doing great, by the way, now. And in fact, the whole non-binary conversation, while it's very difficult for them to have, has been really cool that they now want to have this conversation with me because I'm an adult. We're past things. And that's wonderful that my family can do that. Um, but the coming out for this one was so incredibly supportive. Um, I'm blessed to have a really amazing kind of core group of friends that are my chosen family. Also, um, the theater community is, as we all know, as, as bitchy as it can get. It's, it's incredibly loving. And um, I'm, I'm first and foremost a theater actor. I transitioned into TV and film later in life. So it was really cool to have a lot of my core New York theater friends really support me publicly as well as, you know, message me privately to talk to me about how they support this new coming out for me. So I have to know, in your theater studies, and we're, we're all theater kids here, Peppermint was a theater kid, and Bowie and I theater kid, what were your favorite mm -hmm. kind of classes, and what were your worst classes? Oh, you mean like in acting school? Yes, yeah. Okay, um, I excelled at movement. Um, I, I mean, I have nice. some like very limited dance training. I'm a former gymnast, so that, like, that certainly helped me, but... Like, I think movement is something that I could, like, get a good grade in because if you, like, did enough push-ups or, like, rolled around the floor and said you saw blue on the wall enough times and you, like, kind of won the class. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I like getting good grades. So, I like, I was a good student because I could, like, out-move everybody. Um, and worst class, honestly... Honestly, it was like the contemporary shit. Like mm. I learned how to be like a natural sort of like go with the flow film type actor later in life. I excelled mm. at Shakespeare. I excelled at the movement, but like just fucking relaxing and saying words like I meant them actually took me a second. Mm. Yeah, that is funny. When I mean, I was yeah. raised on musical theater and that is so presentational. It's like, yep. you want me to have a real mm -hmm. moment on stage and not break into, uh, you know, an eight page song? Are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Misha, what I really want to know is uh, from the entertainment business side of it, and Bowie, I'm sure you have mm -hmm. um, experience with this as well. How did your relationship with your agent, managers, PR um, change? You know, the actor we saw in The Goldfinch and Nosferatu is a bit different from the expressive photos and moments that you share on your social media, which, I mean, every social media picture is is its, its own story, by the way. I'm addicted to your social media. Um, Stop it. No, but it's true. And Bowie, you're the same way. It's these such expressive um, pictures that are, are art in its own. Um, but did you have to kind of let your talent team know this was going on? Were they afraid of your ability to, to book more roles? Um, did they want you to keep it in the closet? Uh, was it a concern? Uh, you be know, honest, I'm Misha. Really glad. I know I, you know I'm gonna be. Yes. Um, it's 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 funny that you bring it up because this is this is obviously relatively new, and it's been we've I've been in conversation with my entire team about this exact subject. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I want to say everybody has been incredibly supportive. And there's it's funny how it's the little conversations that mean the most. Um, 
those photo shoots that you're talking about, the stuff that I put on Instagram, the stuff that is most recently going into like interviews and like the, the makeup that I choose to wear, it's, I, I understand that at times it can feel really flashy and I've had that conversation with my reps, but I, I hope and I do believe that it lands on them when I say that it's, it really means a lot to me. In fact, I'm literally getting emotional talking about it. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, I, I wasn't allowed to do this growing up, mm -hmm. and I, I never felt like I had anything to latch onto as a superpower growing up. I was a really lonely kid. I dealt with a lot of mental health issues. So to have this thing, this this dress, this makeup, these heels that I can put on for an interview, for uh, something to be posted in you know, variety, and to, to have that be the Misha that the world meets is so incredibly important to me, yes. regardless of what roles I play, because th this is me kind of coming to fruition as like somebody that I'm really proud of. So I do believe that my whole team is, uh, you know, to varying degrees, really supportive of that. And I'm just going to continue to push for exactly that messaging. Have you seen a change in the roles that you've been auditioning for? Is it now like, oh, well, uh, let's put Misha up for more feminine roles or just feminine roles? Um, have you seen a decrease in, um, in, in other types of roles? Uh, I'm really lucky that the answer is all around good news. I've seen and uh, ac across my little desk, I've had some amazing non-binary oriented scripts come my way. And some of the auditions that I'm going in for are truly gender ambiguous or intentionally non-binary. And they are, uh, I'm so excited by the writing that Hollywood is really churning out quite quickly to keep up with how many people this means a lot to. Um, and I'm also going in for, you know, your standard Disney plus TV show, gay guy from Ohio. I love that because yeah. so, like, it's, it's so cute. <laughs> You know, and it's funny when we're talking about these actors, we're talking about, oh, gay actor, oh, trans actor, oh, mm -hmm. non binary actor. The common phrase and all of that is actor. Like, yep. our job is to act. Whatever role you put in front of us is to act, regardless of our orientation, our identity. Like, yep. we're actors, for God's mm -hmm. sake. Um, so, I want to talk about the musical A Clockwork Orange. Mm. Very presentational, very different piece of musical theater. What was the rehearsal process like, and what was the biggest challenge for you doing that show? Well, I will say that I would be doing everybody a disservice if I didn't say it was a play with music, not a musical. Right. And I say that yeah. I say that more to speak to my abilities. I did exactly one double pirouette in the show, and it was a ginormous accomplishment because that's not my cup of tea. Girl, um, I can't even walk up the stairs right. <laughs> Fair enough. That too. It's COVID. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what was the question again about Clark Gordon? Uh, what, what was the rehearsal uh, process like and what was your biggest challenge? Um, so that I'm lucky that the rehearsal process really played to my strength. It's to give you perspective and because you're both theater people, you'll get this. This yeah. was a 90 minute show with approximately a 70 page script. And of those 70 pages, 20 were text. The rest were movement sequences. This was a movement heavy yeah. show. So I my star student movement kid was doing really well um i and i'm the little one so like i was the, i played the track they threw around a lot i landed a lot you know lots some flips and that kind of stuff it was really intense i have never been in more bro -y mask shape in my fucking life um <laughs> that whole cast I, it was uh, like is, is 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 that a porn or is that a musical <laughs> <laughs> is that a porn <laughs> i mean honestly yes i mean everybody I mean, looked gorgeous no i'm just, well, thank you. And I'm sure you know by now, but like literally the New York Times article, it wasn't about us. It was about our workout before the show. An entire <laughs> article was written about it. Oh, Lord. Which, bless. Yeah. Um, but no, it was really rewarding. Um, <laughs> Hashtag the, bless. The, <laughs> the, the cast really is incredible. They're all still very much my friends to this day. Uh, our director, Alexander Spencer Jones, is just an incredible human being. And it's it was so gratifying to be in such a presentational show that had such a grounded acting base that wasn't like, you know, touch step or the fuck musical theater people do sorry yeah no 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 um and so we're talking about your movement and i want to talk about what i think is your most ambitious project to date it's that of your very own film every day not only is it ambitious from a creative point of view writing producing starring it's also a very intimate showcase of your own struggle with eating disorder which affects movement which affects every minute of your yeah. day uh you basically <laughs> missed your high school years because you're in treatment um was it hard working on this film while working through your daily struggle with an eating disorder? I mean, it's very close to home. And not only are you living it, but then you have to write, produce, and star in it, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm ambitious to a fault, y'all. Um, <laughs> it, it was equal 
parts cathartic and very scary. Um, I'm the reason the film is called Every Day. You know, funny punctuation aside, yeah. ED eating disorder every day. It's called Every Day because that's how I re approach recovery. Mm. Um, I, I I'm of the school of thought that recovery is an everyday process, and I wake up every single day making the active decision to be in recovery. That way, when relapses happen, and I'm always honest, they do. They've happened as recently as the past couple of years for me being in this industry. Mm -hmm. I'm not discouraged to the point that I've fallen off a cliff or that I don't earn a coin. Instead, I just get up the next day, every single day, and I decide to go back into recovery. Um, this film was incredibly personal to me, but it was actually mostly cathartic because of my partner that I worked on it with, Angelica Santiago. She went to theater school with me and she also struggles and struggled with an eating disorder and she's in recovery as well. We came together to make this film because we didn't see representation of like messy, you know, yeah. in your head, really kind of in the nitty gritty eating disorder in the mainstream. It's always some beautiful thin white girl bent over a toilet that That's exactly does it right. and yeah. it's over. Um, so yeah, it was really gratifying in that cathartic way to live through those experiences on camera and know that people are going to watch it and be asking questions about eating disorders. That's the whole point of the film. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's there's two afflictions that really hit the LGBT community that never get talked about. Um, domestic violence with same-sex couples mm -hmm. is hardly ever talked about. And another huge issue uh, is eating disorders. Uh, because we're all concerned about what we look like on Instagram. We're all in concerned with smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. If you're in yeah. West Hollywood, God forbid, you have bigger than a waist uh, 32. Um, <sighs> and it's this, it's this, you know, uh, it's this balance of the benefit of social media, but also the negative. Yeah. And nobody really talks about how difficult it is to stay in an ideal, number one, in the LGBT community, but as well as in the film community. I mean, you're seeing yourself bigger than life. You're being told, here's your costume. Here's what you look like. Here's Here's what the character looks like. Um, you know, uh, how do you think we combat that in the LGBT community? Um, I, I would hope that experiences similar to like what I had in my own little like non-binary coming out resonate with folks to that effect, because like my eating disorder very much was a way for me to gain control of my life and to mm -hmm. kind of rebel against very conservative, very, you know, not accepting parents and a way for me to feel like I said, in control and, you know, yes, beautiful. And because I wasn't getting that from my identity at current. Now that I've built a life that I'm really proud of, I have queer friends that support me for being me, not because I'm A in a movie or B the right kind of gay. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'm now really comfortable with how I present and I do and I eat what my body wants and I put on my body what it likes. And I'm always frank with my costumer, it, it, working on a film, what makes me comfortable. That security in my identity, in my queer identity, is what has furthered my recovery. So I, I, I hope that people in the LGBTQIA plus community have those moments, that community, those, those moments with themselves where they're able to kind of see the good and the amazingness in them. That doesn't have anything to do with what waist size you are, because it, I, that, that kind of tie in of the, that like Hell's Kitchen, WeHo toxic, yep. you know, culture mm -hmm. is kind of what really did me in personally. Well, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Yeah. It's like you're a bear. It's like no, no, I'm not. I'm I'm just me. <laughs> when I say to that that point too, like um, on that, you know, how important do you feel is, is visibility? Like having a full the, the full spectrum, whether it's to the queer community or or speaking to to mel mental health issues, or I, I've got a family background of of, of substance abuse. You know, to, mm -hmm. to have those conversations, like you said, it it's then getting people to to educate themselves to ask the questions. Like how, how important do you feel that is um, even to speaking to the non-binary experience? Like, have you seen a character that you see yourself in or are you being that person um, because you still haven't seen it? And, and, and what does Hollywood need to do to increase that representation across the board? Sure. I mean, I think the answer to all of those points of that question is the same. Obviously, yes, representation, but we do need to see it, like you just said, across the board. I, Yes, to an extent, I'm being the person that I didn't get to be or that I didn't see when I was growing up. Um, but there's so few at the moment, there's a handful of amazing trans, queer, non-binary actors that are really doing the thing. And we have some amazing starts. But just like that, just like substance abuse, just like mental health, if we don't see it, splashed over all kinds of media in all kinds of different ways we 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 assume as a society that it's niche that there's a few people that that affects and that's it the fact of the matter is that's not true eating disorders affect a wide range of people both in and out of the queer community substance abuse is a ginormous problem in this country and people finding their identity at a young age especially now with like the gen z TikTok, like everybody is so 
like in, engrossed in like full real adult life so early that the fact that there aren't a bunch of non-binary actors and characters just kind of splashed all over TV and film, I do think is a problem because how is some kid that doesn't have the vocabulary yet to say, mom, I don't like what I see in the mirror today, mm, or yep. dad, I want to wear a dress today. If they don't see that regularly on in the mainstream as an accepted normal part of life, they are going to feel othered. And I think, I think feeling othered is the root of a lot of these problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny, the power of the entertainment industry, non-binary was never even talked about until we saw some of these celebrity kids coming out and being supported by their parents as non-binary. It's like, what is that? You know, we didn't know, but it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a celebrity's kid, so now it's a thing. Like, I see, I've seen mm -hmm. that. I've also seen, even in gender roles, changing, even in commercials, yeah. we're seeing so much representation of, of gay couples in commercials, slowly but surely, but I think we're also seeing mm -hmm. more commercials where the girls are not necessarily playing with dolls, and the boys are not necessarily playing, you know, army, mm -hmm. and or a dad is at home raising the kids. I think we're seeing some of that shift, and I think it's slow, but hopefully with this new administration, we're going to be opening up. up. Yeah, we're going to be opening up the conversation. I mean, like we were talking about with Peppermint, you know, the first time a president-elect to talk in their first speech about the trans community alongside the gay community is is huge. So it's yeah. it's it's baby steps. Baby steps. So I want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a hot button, and I put my foot in my mouth all the time because I'm. That's just who I am. And so using pronouns has become very uh, challenging for me. I can barely remember somebody's name right after they've told me it. You know, that's just. Blah. Um, and I come from a different generation where, like I said, it was gay straight, and that's it. Mm. Um, and now we have the use of different pronouns. Um, my experience has been good and bad in getting pronouns wrong. I've had people take the time and say, this is the reasoning behind it. This is how I would like to be called. And it's like we have a conversation. But there's also sometimes this anger that if you tell us once or it's listed somewhere that we should automatically get it. And if you don't get it, then you're, you're my enemy. Mm. How do we how do we kind of curb some of that anger and how do we educate our fellow members of the LGBT community on how to use pronouns and the importance of pronouns? It's just not a silly thing like oh, they want to be called what? Oh, OK. It's 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 something bigger that means something bigger. Yes, it is. Um, I mean, look, I, I'll be the first one to say that I, I, as somebody who uses exclusively they, them pronouns now, struggle with it. I struggle to advocate for myself. I One of the first times that I was ever misgendered and called he, him by, uh, you know, a new producer friend that didn't know me well. And like, I, it was a very social loving situation. And he just started saying he, man, in, in reference to me, Misha. And I froze. I didn't know what to do because I'd never been misgendered before. And in that experience, I, I felt the first for the first time, oh, shit, that's not me. Mm -hmm. And I now know who I am. And you're not calling me who I am. That's really disheartening. Um, but I, I have a couple of things that I really like about this conversation. One, I have a friend who works actually a lot in the drag world. And um, because of the plethora of pronouns that you're going to encounter there, um, my friend always uses they, them pronouns when referring to people. If people go by she, her, he, him, whatever, they will probably tell you. But what's the harm in just saying, yeah, them over there. Oh, they were they went that way. It's literally non-offensive, in my opinion. That's one person's like catch-all that I, I like to use. The other thing is I have started literally, whether it's on my Instagram bio, whether I meet somebody for the first time, you know, my pronouns are they, them. What are yours? Making, turning it back the conversation on somebody who maybe isn't used to always announcing their pronouns because they've grown up in a cis body and they like she, her, or he, him. Just immediately starting the conversation that way so that they know, oh, this is a thing that I should be aware of. Great. And I'm now included. My pronouns are he, him, or she, her. You know, that, I feel like that's a good way to go about it. Yeah, yeah. I also uh, had the best advice uh, from a PFLAG meeting, actually. They said if you're an ally, um, put it uh, in your email signature, make it part of your conversation that yeah. even mm -hmm. if you don't identify uh, f with a different pronoun, it gets people used to that conversation, even if you think it's obvious. Um, just start using it whoever you are. Um, Bowie, how did that change for you, going in for auditions as an actress with your previous life yeah. and then now coming into your, your, your identity – has that been difficult, kind of switching the, the language? Um, I mean, I, you know, I've stepped in and out of acting, I think, for that reason, because I, I kept going out for auditions when female identified, and I was like, why don't I fit? Why doesn't this fit? Why doesn't it feel right? And so I had to leave and come back and, and really find myself. Um, I, I'm fortunate to have a, a management team, Mad, Mad Catch Entertainment, who... Uh, 
um, Robin McWilliams very in, in the queer community. And, and so we just have those upfront conversations like, hey, this is not necessarily a non-binary role. Uh, you know, they may be looking for somebody, she, her pronouns, but are you still open and willing? And I'm like, at the, the end mm. of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a human being. And so if I resonate with the words, I'm going to go out for the audition. And if they like what they like, then, you know, gender aside, whatever it was written doesn't matter at that point. Um, I, you know, um, so it's, it's just been, a, it's just been a journey, right? Uh, just, just moving away from things that don't feel right. Um, and then also accepting, I've had to really relearn and teach myself that gender in, in my belief does not exist. It lives on a spectrum. So really, really reteaching myself that. Misha. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that, by the way. Uh, Misha, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a nosy bear. Right. Uh, so love and dating, what's going on right now, Misha? <laughs> Ooh, uh, who, um, me? Okay. You're blushing. I'm, no, that's the blush. That's different. I applied that. Um, <laughs> I, um, to, to be completely frank, between my very intense desire to not have the whole world crumble because of a pandemic, I am, I'm staying safe on that front um, when it comes to casual dating. Yes. Um, I also, I this whole little journey that we've been talking about, this whole interview is still incredibly fresh and real for me. Mm -hmm. So I've had to relearn things about how I approach sex and dating and mm -hmm. how my pronouns are the first, one of the first things that we talk about on a dating app or on a, and you know, God help us if we ever get back there, a real person date. So like, I'm very alone right now and I'm very okay with that. Not in like the, I'm fine guys, I'm fine. Yeah. It's not that. <laughs> it's like the, I, it's like the, I'm really enjoying kind of what Bowie was saying earlier, like dating myself. I've literally never done that, especially not honestly. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, and, it, you know, there has to be a little trepidation and a little fear having come out as non-binary and then to kind of enter the, the dating world because it's kind of like you are new to the whole field. It's a different language. Uh, whom whom you might attract would might be different. It's a whole... Oh God, dating is so hard as it is. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, <laughs> the, the, answer, the answer to all of that is yes, I agree. And also, like, but, but it's given me a new sense of abandon, which I really like. It's like there's all this toxic nonsense that you'll get especially on dating apps when people are emboldened by the screen and they're not there keyboard like, warriors yeah, sure, is, is what i call them it's so ridiculous yes fair but also just straight up keyboard bitches like just like being <laughs> rude um and when that pops up i'm newly empowered especially when they either refuse to use pronouns or, or start making fun of like me wearing makeup or whatever the whatever god help them they're trying to get at me for yeah it emboldens me to either obviously immediately block or just shut them down with a comment like, I really like who I am right mm -hmm. now. I love my mascara. It's a big part of me. So you can fuckity fuck off. Yep. Like that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> I love, love it. it. Okay, we're going to take a look at the trailer for Freaky. Um, and then when we come back, we are going to talk all about the movie making process uh, for it and, um, and your character. All right, Kurt, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. That's me, Millie. Ordinary, boring Millie. I love your dress. I think I saw it at Discount Bonanza. <laughs> okay, so I was never the most popular. Homecoming's this weekend. Booker is gonna be at the dance. And boys never really noticed me. Wow! <laughs> Honestly, if this was a horror movie, I'd be one of the first ones to get killed. You, the creepy dude in the mask. Like I said. <laughs> but actually, it turns out. Where am I? I didn't get killed. Oh my god, why do I sound like that? I woke up in the killer's body. <laughs> the Blissfield Butcher strikes again. Don't freak out. <laughs> You're black! I'm gay! We are so dead! Ow! Will you stop? It's me, it's Millie! Hill, Hill, Blissfield, high, feel our glory and our might. Oh my god! And not only is that psycho wearing my body, he's killing it. He's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Who knows how many of our friends he's gonna kill? Are you sure this is safe? No. <laughs> 
Oh my God, it's a slaughterhouse. I have like less than six hours to swap back or I'm gonna be stuck in this body forever. Hurry up, loser, I gotta take a dump. I have to admit, it hasn't been all bad. I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to interrupt. I- Move! How's that feel? I'll make you wish your stupid face was never born. Oh my God, did you just pee yourself? Yes! Whoa, what am I wearing? I'm actually really liking this for you. We're gonna get killed by Murder Barbie. I can't wait to kill you. Time to stop this asshole. We're in this together. I want my body back. Come and get it. Look, I know I look like the butcher, but it's Millie. He's crazy. Okay, Booker, can you look at me, please? Booker! Dry up, bitch. Booker, help! Booker! Will you shut up? <laughs> Booker! <laughs> <laughs> Number one at the box office, and I have to tell you, Murder Barbie is my new grinder profile name. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm I, so glad. <laughs> I love everything uh, Bloomhouse. I love the idea of this film. Like I said, it mixes camp with mm-hmm. a throwback to Freaky Friday um, with horror. But there's a little bit more going on here. Um, I love that it's really dealing with gender themes. Like, quite literally, we're switching yep. bodies. Yes. Um, we see Vince Vaughn as as the girl, kind of, you know, getting sensual with, with the guy. Mm-hmm. There's this whole feminine versus masculine theme here yes. that is a pretty strong undercurrent to the whole film. Was was that the intention? Was that what was talked about? Or was that your own personal experience in doing the film that it was kind of a celebration of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, look, we have two very queer filmmakers, Chris Landon and Michael Kennedy, that put this thing together. It was never lost on them that this film was mm-hmm. going to have deeper undertones than just a campy horror film because of the nature of the body swap. It's a, it's a grown, granted, serial killer man swapping bodies with a 17-year-old girl that's still figuring out her identity. And yes. that's the big conversation that was happening on set, is that she comes into her own by going through this crazy experience, literally swapping bodies, and no spoilers, obviously, but you know, we, we see a, a, a female character trans, you know, go out of her body to have these crazy, crazy experiences, and then, and then there's this moment where you really see her come into her own, and I think that's, and that's an incredible message, even within a campy horror film. Um, and you know, sometimes in horror films, the uh, the gay character, like you, you even uh, you know, tongue in cheek, laughed when it's like, mm-hmm. "You're black, I'm gay, we're, we're going to be dead." Um, but sometimes there's there's the idea to make them so stereotypical and so cliche. Um, how did you creatively come up with the character of Josh so that it had that camp quality that is so funny, mm-hmm. but it also had some kind of reality to uh, a gay student in high school? Huh. That, I mean, that literally started in my audition. The first time that the, I, after I taped and all that, the first time I like sat down via Zoom with our director, Chris Landon, to talk about the role before before booking it and hate to use genitalia, but I got real ballsy. And I was, <laughs> he, asked, <laughs> he asked me, he asked me, you know, do I have any questions or comments or anything about the character, anything that I wanted him to know? And I said, yeah, if you give me this character, if you give me this role, I'm going to make this kid a human being. It's in the writing, I can see it on the page. I will not let this kid just be a stereotypical gay best friend. I'm gonna work on that if you give me this role. Lo and behold, apparently that worked. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that was always the conversation with Josh. And that was uh, especially, you know, Michael Kennedy, our co-writer really took it to heart to make a, char- a gay character that he never got to see when he was growing up and he wrote into this horror film. And so him and I really connected about making Josh a fully fleshed out human being. Uh, what was it really like working with uh, Vince Vaughn? Yes. <laughs> Vince Vaughn is, honestly, you know what, like, Red Hog Real Talk, like, I was t- I was told so many things about what I might want to expect about Vince Vaughn, uh, yep. so many yep. assumptions that I walked into mm-hmm. this film with, and they were so pleasantly shattered. Vince Vaughn is the most, into, and, I, and I even say this, I've said this in a couple interviews and I promise it's because it's really, really true. Mm-hmm. He's the most intensely curious human being you'll ever meet in your life. Like he he will at on set at 3 a.m., you are tired, it is a long day, you have four more hours of shooting to go. He will continue to ask you questions and want to know about your real life. And he, um, and he obviously shares a good amount about his life. He certainly comes from a certain amount of stardom and he comes from a slightly different generation than me, yes. obviously, but 
he, it, the conversations that I have with him were really gratifying, even about things like queerness and gender. Uh, well, that is refreshing here because you do hear things about yeah. Vince Vaughn. You know, I've had a crush on him for, forever, <laughs> um, not always for the sure. right reasons, but I, I would have an idea of what to expect from him. So, so that is good to hear. But didn't didn't he injure you in real life during a fighting scene or something? Yeah. <laughs> no, that is not true. My oh. co-star Celeste did. We have to blame Celeste. Oh. <laughs> and it, it's um, it's used in the I, film, right? It is used in the film. <laughs> um, so I um, so. Uh, uh, during one of our epic fight scenes, you kind of see it in the trailer, but um, I have to monkey on top of Vince, and I am a very small human. He's a very tall human, yes. so I've got a literal running start. <laughs> um, and Celeste is meant to grab a frying pan and hit me with it to knock me off. It's a prop frying pan, but there was the wrong plastic seam on the wrong oh. part of it, and it sliced the fuck out of my forehead. I'm like gushing blood right out of my forehead. Mm. And it was a great take. They used it, but then everybody, the whole set just froze, like, what we do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, they put some like skin glue on it. They CGI'd it later and we kept shooting. Wow. <laughs> That's a trooper. Dedication. Yeah. Now, uh, are, are you a fan of, are, are you a fan of horror films? I, I realize now that I am, but I have learned so fucking much about like the intricacies of the horror world after mm -hmm. doing this film. And you know, Chris Landon and Michael Kennedy, both incredibly in touch horror gays. Yes. So like I, I've been learning a lot, but um, no, I mean, I've always loved a good horror film. Like Jennifer's Body is by far it's your my favorite horror film. Yeah. I think it's it's ah, it's, it's, uh, it's so good. Um, and I think it tackles the way that women are treated, and mm. it tackles you know sexuality in a really fun way. I, I like Diablo Cody, bless. Mm. Um, but it's one of those things where you don't realize that it's such a deep genre that has such a wide ar array of things that it tackles until yeah. I guess you, for me it was being in a horror film and realizing oh queerness, social issues, mental health, they all get tackled and then some in horror films and in a really kind of fun, accessible, scary way. Um, what do you, uh, what would you say is your message to other non-binary actors? Hmm. I would say the message is something that I am still learning to this day in conversations that I'm having as recently as a few hours ago, which is you have in your possession an understanding of your identity that is a literal superpower. Just like that that feeling of security that you were always longing for when, mm -hmm. you know, your cis friends were saying she, her, he, him, putting on the baggy jeans and that didn't feel like you. That, now that you have your non-binary identity and you're figuring out what queerness and gender or lack of gender means to you, hold on to it and use it. It has gotten me farther in life in the most gratifying, heartfelt, honest way than mm -hmm. any other declaration of identity in my life. And it's because I get to be passionate about who I am instead of hiding parts of who I am to conform to either a gay man, a straight man, anything. I get to be who I am and I get to be proud of it and use it as a superpower. So I hope that other non-binary youth take that to heart and use that same kind of mentality. I love that. You're amazing. <laughs> and I have to, I have to, I, I read your Variety article and I, I just have to say, like, I was so inspired because to be so public and, and to disclose, you know, it is an honor and a privilege to get to know somebody. And I think sometimes we live so publicly that people forget that and, and, and we get lazy about actually learning about the other person and listening to how they identify, whether that's they, them, mm -hmm. they, he, or, 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 you know, a multitude of, of, of labels that resonate. Um, but for you to be so open and honest, I just have to thank you because it's it's that courage and, and moment of visibility um, that, that validates, I, I felt so seen in, in, in reading that. So thank you for, for being so open and honest in who you are. Oh, Jesus Christ, thank you for saying, literally goosebumps. That's, I. <laughs> I can only hope that that's what I'm putting out into the world. So it's so gratifying to hear that, that you felt that way. And I, I, yeah, thank you, God. <laughs> so Misha, how prepared are you? You know, once you're in a Bloomhouse film, uh, like there's a whole <laughs> different fan base that come that comes with it. You know, number one film. Uh, this is a huge exposure. Um, are you kind of, have you kind of prepared yourself for, for how things change from here on out? Mm. I mean, how does anybody prepare themselves? Right, yeah, right. I'm really proud, like, <laughs> I'm really proud of the work that I did, and and I'm and I'm I'm lucky to have a good amount of friends that have lived semi-public lives in acting and other parts of the industry before this that I'm close with that I've talked to. But look, I mean, kind of going back to what Bowie was just saying, like I, I, I don't really give a shit 
if people are fans of me or not, or if I'm going to get a shit ton of DMs or not. That's not what I'm in this for. Mm -hmm. I am, however, in this for a maximum platform because I did not have a mm -hmm. fucking role model growing up when it came to being uh, yeah. a, a, an artistic little queer kid. It just, it didn't happen for me. So if I'm going to be able to, you know, play pretend in some awesome films and then get up on something like this or a stage or a major award show and say, by the way, I'm queer as fuck and that's okay. And also mental health is super great to talk about. Goodbye, everybody. That feels amazing to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm much more looking to that direction than like if public life is hard, great. I will deal with it. I think it's a, it's absolutely something I can handle, but I'm really in it for the, the maximum do good platform that feels right to me. Uh, Misha, are you ready for a little rapid fire? Yes. Do it. Okay. okay. Uh, what Hollywood film would you love to star in the reboot of? Uh, hmm. uh, Practical Magic. Ooh. Oh, yeah. God, that's good. Uh, worst date ever? Worst date ever. Um, I think we got we got stuck. Uh, you know, like Chelsea Piers, um, the like the big gaming area outdoors in New York. Yeah. We got stuck out when it was really cold and wet, and I didn't want to admit that I didn't want to be doing like the mini golf or whatever we were doing while it was this like <laughs> wet outside and I was freezing because I really liked the guy. Didn't end up working out. I was mad that it didn't work out. Okay. Uh, one acting tip you'd give Vince Vaughn. <laughs> um, I hesitate on this one because he taught me so much. Um, uh. Maybe give me a heads up before you're gonna try something crazy, but I also don't want to say that because him trying crazy shit that surprised me are always the takes that they fucking use. So yeah. okay, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, who would you want to swap bodies with for a day? Ooh. Oh come on, Lady Gaga. Yes. <laughs> oh, like, sold. Okay. <laughs> yes. But if I was in her body, yeah. I, I I wouldn't know <sighs> if, what I would want to do for the day. Would I want to go shopping? Would I want to record every single mm. song I would want to? Would I just have sex all day? Like <laughs> I don't know what I would do as, as Lady Gaga for, for a day. Um, okay. I would argue all of those things. But all of the above. yes, right. It's gonna be a busy day. Um, what is a Russian a Russian custom or food that you just don't really get? <laughs> Um, I like a lot of Russian customs. It's, it's the potatoes. I'm not a potato person and potatoes are really part like, you know, boiled, mashed, like always at a family dinner. And I'm just, I don't even fucking like French fries. So the fact that it's like a, it's a, like a, a staple food is just like, it's not even me being shitty and avoiding carbs. It's literally like, I don't like that food. Why is it at every single meal? Russians. Misha, I thought we, we were going to be friends. <laughs> I mean, if you don't like a French fry, I, I, I don't even know what to do with this. <laughs> it, it's okay. I will be really bougie and get some kind of like, you know, zucchini fry situation and sit yes. right there next to you and eat them. <laughs> yes. Misha, tell our audience where uh, you want them to find you, follow you, and love you. I am on Instagram as Misha Oshirovich. It is, I am the only one in the world that I know of, so go ahead and follow that. Love it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, can't wait to see Freaky again <laughs> and for everybody to, to run out and see it. And um, and thank you so much for sharing y your story with us. Oh, my God. Thank you for having me. This was so fucking fun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And once all this COVID is over, we we'll hang out in person. We'll, we'll yes. have you in. And I'll, I'll hide... I I'll, I'll hide the potatoes. <laughs> okay, good. I would love that. Yay. Thank you, Misha. Bye, y'all. Okay, Bowie, where do you want uh, our audience to find and follow you? Um, I am at uh, Bowie underscore McFadden on Instagram. Um, and I, I don't do the Twitter, so you, you're just going to find me on Instagram. And please uh, do find Bowie on Instagram because it is uh, – it's a it's – a, Visual delight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that's all, folks. It's always a grab bag of fun every week on On The Rocks Radio Show. Um, and my single men, don't forget to join me for the Zoom speed dating. Uh, head to gaydesertguy.com for more info. And coming up, we have RuPaul's Drag Race, Ms. Cracker, uh, right before she heads off on her United States road tour, uh, by the way. And then we also have Star Trek Picard's Jonathan Del Arco is coming in. A big thank you to our engineer, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt, for your pun. Uh, our guest. <laughs> Uh, Misha and Peppermint and of course my guest co-host today Bowie uh, we're definitely going to have you back but lots more to talk about and also you our fabulous audience we love you stay happy stay healthy and stay tipsy bloop <laughs> this has been another episode of On The Rocks tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com subscribe like review and share until next week, stay fabulous. <laughs>